Okay, we shall start now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to index webinar number three on EX hazardous areas and functional safety to discuss the overlap between these systems. Right now, the report on BP Texas City disaster has been released. I would highly suggest people uh, review that. We will share that link as well. It talks about the breakdowns in functional safety and EX. So when we talk about functional safety, we're talking about different layers of protection. So a simple explanation would be to show this image where we're talking about, we have a process control layer for process values, process control layer for process shutdown. When we receive a trip alarm, then we have our shutdown systems. So those are our prevention systems. Under our mitigation systems, we have pressure relief valves, pressure shutdown valves, so active protection. We have dikes, so bunding around, let's say, an oil tank or sear. So that's a passive layer of protection. And then we have plant and emergency response. So that could be your firefighting team, that could be your SIS safety instrument system may have a backup system. So when we talk about layers of protection analysis, we're using LOPA to determine the risk levels of selected scenarios. It's a method to evaluate high consequence scenarios, determining if the combination of probability of occurrence and the severity meets the company's risk tolerance. So the company's risk tolerance could be the EPC, could be the end user. So the key questions they ask is, how safe is safe enough? How many independent layers are needed? And how much risk reduction should each layer provide? So when we look at a typical process, we'll have hazards. Then we'll have our process control systems, alarms, automatic systems, physical protection, land emergency, and community emergency response. Now, typically for a high consequence scenario, which usually involves the combination of equipment and human failures, it's identified during a HAZOP, a hazard and operability risk assessment study. The LOPA is then implemented for a closer and more careful assessment of this scenario. It's a quantitative screening tool which provides a consistent, objective, and defensible approach. So it's with this image here, it's making it easy for the humans to understand each layer of protection and to define each of them so that we can reduce the chance of human error in the future for operators, maintainers. If they can understand this, they can understand that one fault here can lead to further faults and perhaps, perhaps a runaway process or an incident or event happening. Now, during a HAZOP, 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 the study is a design review of the techniques used for hazard identification. Now, for hazard identification, they have to in involve many different things such as which operations are there what is the process material chemical what are the consequences of failure to hazard controls what significant damage could be happen to people environment property it's supposed to be carried out in a structural approach by an experienced multidiscipline team facilitated by a hazard leader now 
Typical teams include the design consultant, the, the project manager, a production manager, a chemist, chemical engineer, a maintenance manager, an electrical engineer, an instrument engineer, a quality control engineer. Now, what are their EX competencies of these people? Have they been trained, assessed, and certified? How will their study impact the hazardous area classification and the equipment design, EX equipment design and selection? An interesting point is, what about a meteorologist? Environmental considerations. I would say that that's very important to consider. When we consider EX, we have to consider ambient temperatures, wind directions. The hazardous area classification will be impacted by these things. So would the process not be affected by plus 50 Celsius in the summer and minus 40 Celsius in the winter? Certainly it shall. So for hazardous area classifications, the first step of area classification should be to assemble a team with fundamental understandings of the facility's operational areas, its electrical equipment, its non-electrical mechanical equipment, processes, maintenance requirements, and environmental influences. Yes, a safety engineer would also be needed during a hazard, but sometimes that safety engineer is included in one of the other quality control engineer that can be an HSEQ. So quality health, safety and environmental engineer. So when we say quality control engineer, do remember that that could be ISO 9001, 14001 and 45001 all in one engineer. So when considering all these different influences, wouldn't you want to utilize the hazard team? But what are their EX competencies? So when we talk about environmental influences, that meteorologist, how will the temperature of that day, the average temperature during the winter, during the summer, influence a gas, liquid, or other process compound? Will its dispersion rate change? due to different temperatures and wind conditions. It certainly will. That will change your hazardous area classification. How will those environmental influences affect the EX equipment de design, selection, and inspection? If you dive into a piece of equipment that is rated for T4 to T6 temperature ratings, Usually that has to do with the different ambient temperatures. We've had examples of equipment in the Middle East that was only rated to 25 degrees operating temperature. Is that EX operationally safe? Certainly it is not. So all these people have a part to play in hazardous area classification and in functional safety. That's where that overlap is. Has this area classification only done by an electrical engineer? It can be done. Is it correct? In my mind, no. So potential weaknesses in uh, functional safety. Well, influences. When people apply as low as reasonably practicable, Sometimes time, cost, stakeholders, such as shareholders, provide the influence. Once again, the env environmental factors. How was the LARP applied? When people do risk assessments, everybody's idea of risk differs from one another. So what are their EX, in competen EX competencies of the hazard team. Were they involved during the hack? 
the hazard area classification? Does the separation of departments of functional safety and EX operational safety cause issues? So if you had a different team that was doing the hazard and a different team doing the hack, if they're not intercommunicating, is there a chance for issues, potential failures in the future? Are we creating holes? When we talk about misunderstandings of the different uh, functional safety standards, 61508 refers to safety related systems. Well, 61511 refers to process industry sector. So when we're talking about the risks, when we talk about the Swiss cheese model, what we want to do is avoid the risks avoid the potential things that can happen by putting controls in place. So we can mitigate, respond to an emergency, mitigate any problems, prevent containment loss, detect gas, so control, and prevent containment. So there's different layers of protection. Now, when we go into the functional safety standards, 61508, which is an umbrella standard, which is generic and sometimes vague, provides various industry sectors with their, provides vague information, but is specifically for suppliers of safety systems, but can also be used to some degree of suppliers of equipment to be used in safety systems. This standard has been applied by some EPCs and end users as the only standard that is needed. Now, process safety, the process industry sector actually calls for 61511, which is safety instrument systems for the process industry sector, which its language and context is specifically to that industry. It is performance-based rather than, rather than prescriptive. The design is based on risk analysis and to provide the required risk reduction. The focus is on the end user's application. If it's a sawmill, it's on that type of process. If it's just on liquid natural gas installation, it's just on that process. Hydrogen, just that process. and specifically on what safety instrument function they are trying to achieve. This does not detail the requirements of embedded software and programming languages, which are found in 61508. So 61508 is for the manufacturers more so, while 61508 is used on a project for the programming languages and software, but if an EPC or end user were not to also integrate 61511, they are missing a lot of important information, which obviously will lead to further risks. If we go back to the Swiss cheese model, by not applying the process industry standard, we are putting ourselves at a lot more risk. So software, when it comes to EX considerations, the new directive, EX direct, ATEX directive 2014-34EU, referring to products, risks arising from software, the design of the software controlled equipment, protective systems and safety devices Special account must be taken to any risk arising from faults. What can be a fault? Technician can enter in the wrong information, could upload the wrong file, could change a function. Somebody could hack into the system. So when we're talking about different control systems and individual equipment, field bus, profi bus, digital control systems, PLCs, Internet of Things. 
more IoT equipment is being created and is starting to be used in process industry. More EX pieces of equipment, which can be controlled wirelessly via Wi Fi. Now, what safety measures are in place to stop someone from perhaps inducing a fault? When that piece of equipment has a fault induced, can you guarantee its safe operating temperature? Will it EX safe operate as it was designed? We cannot validate that. If hacking, if changes have been made. So it's a potential source of ignition. So our critical layers involving EX and functional safety. So we have our safety instrument systems, which is our facility integrity, fire and gas detection systems, which are personnel and facility integrity systems, HIPS, high integrity pressure protection systems, and ESD, emergency shutdown systems. So it's broken down in this model to show you that that would operate electrically, instrumentate, the instrumentation would operate, followed by mechanical devices, so pressure relief valves. Then we have our inspection programs and our maintenance programs. Now, with all the SIS instrumentation and pressure relief devices. Shall these operate in hazardous areas? Certainly will, they will be in hazardous areas. Shall they operate during major incidents and events? Yes, that is their function. Does flammable vapors and gases expand beyond their hazardous areas? Certainly. So if this equipment is outside of a hazardous area, does it need to be EX rated? I would say so. If a hazardous area, if a hazardous event is to happen and there is a release of gas and the gas detectors detect the gas, but they're outside of a hazardous area, but the EX safe operation hasn't been maintained, you now have a potential source of ignition. So your defined hazardous areas during an explosion event during a source of release, that goes out the window. Now it's a potential hazardous area everywhere. If your equipment is not maintained or is not EX, it could cause further sub subsequent explosions. So instrumentation is highly important to our industry. It provides indication, measurement, control, shutdown, and plant and personal integrity systems. So when we talk about critical layers of EX and functional safety, we have many different instrumentation, electrical and mechanical systems. When we refer to process control layer, we have our pressure transmitters. During process shutdown, our alarms, which are then go back to our DCS, whatever system control system that we may have. For emergency shutdown, we have our SIS, safety integrity, safety instrument systems, such as here, or this HIP system right here. Now, our active layer of protections are mechanical devices. So I've seen many process relief valves, which are not hazardous area rated. Now, mechanical equipment, it's metallurgical construction can allow it to cause sparks or arcs 
during use of it. It's metal makeup can affect this. So there are EX rated pressure relief valves, proportional valves. When we get to the passive layer, once again, that's dikes and then emergency response layer. So when we compare these, we have a flow transmitter that could be part of your safety instrument system. You have your fire and gas detection system. So your FGS protection layer. Once again, strobes and horns, part of your fire and gas. So personnel integrity, personnel integrity, plant integrity. When we talk about SIL and SIF, safety instrument functions, they are designed to minimize the process risk to a tolerable level or a LARP. The load is reasonably practical. Each SIFT is assigned a safety integrity level during a SIL analysis, a risk assessment. SIL zero, none, lowest risk. So one, they're about 95% of all um, safety instrument functions. SIL two, about 5%. SIL three, we're talking about less than 1%, but it's more likely in the offshore industries and nuclear, but it is found onshore, such as your HIPs, certain SIS systems, you will find that that is a very critical system. Now, SIL four, which is your highest risk, is only seen in the nuclear industry. But in the nuclear industry, hydrogen is present in the process. And a new development is hydrogen can be used, can be made, hydrogen can be used, uh, sorry, nuclear industry can be used to make hydrogen electro, sorry, and thermochemically. So the hydrogen industry, even in South Africa, with Shell is announcing breakthroughs where within their nuclear plants, they are now starting to produce hydrogen. What about hazardous areas? Usually in the nuclear industry, hazardous area considerations have not been considered. We have experience with that. It was not even thought about. It was not even known. So right now I'm gonna put out a poll and hopefully I can get you guys to answer. I would love to get a 70% six answer rate. So what is the key difference between IEC 61511 and 61508? This is a multiple choice question, so you can give many. So 20%, 20, 30% voted so far. So like I said, we're gonna hope for about 70%. Sixty one percent have voted. Give it another minute. I'll help and go back to the slide about those two. Sixty five percent voted, so just wait for a few more. Uh, 
Okay, close the poll and we'll share that. Good thing that uh, people knew that there was a difference. Now, the 80% response for process industry, that is correct. That also, the correct answers are the final three. But the most important one for process industry, oil and gas, mining, 61511. Now, for the 20% that I said that 61508 can be applied without further consideration, that is putting the end user at risk. Sometimes the end user may not realize that risk, but it is putting them at risk because that is just a vague generic standard. While 61511 is process industry in language and context, performance based rather than prescriptive. Okay. Let's go to poll number two. How can a functional safety team invalidate an EX installation? This is a multiple choice question. Thirty percent voted so far, so give it another minute. Fifty nine percent have voted. Another 25 seconds. Okay. So, how can a functional safety team invalidate an EX installation? When we talk about a functional safety team, we can be talking about the hazard team at the feed stage of a project, pre-feed. We could be talking about the commissioning team after the initial detailed inspection, or we could be talking about operation. So during operation, they could be doing maintenance, func functional maintenance checks. Now, two answers would be the first two. If an instrument is modified by somebody that does not have EX competencies, so by a commissioning technician without EX competencies, they have the potential to invalidate. Yes, the answer can be one or two. They have the potential to invalidate the EX protection technique. Now, they can also change the piece of equipment out if they find that it is not fit for purpose for their function or their functional safety, but they don't have EX competencies or they do not communicate with the EX responsible person, they can change that piece of equipment out and perhaps it no longer has the correct gas group or temperature rating or not correct for the ambient temperature range found on site. But out of the mo out of the two, I would say that 
to the second one is most relevant. Now, saying that they are different systems and have no overlap, when an EX device is inspected, can everybody see me on the webcam? If an EX device is inspected, and the technician, no, not yet. Nobody can see me as of yet. Give it another 10 seconds, it may show up. Anything yet? Okay, so when it comes to an EX inspector working on a gas detector, if that inspector were to remove an IP washer, he has now potentially invalidated the EX safe operation. But if water were to get in, he will now have invalidated potentially the functional safety operation, the device could short out. There could be other issues. If water or dust were to get in, it would cause issue. Now, if a commissioning technician were to come along to a gas detector, he has the chance to invalidate the EX safe operation. If he is not aware of uh, not using an IP washer, he leaves it off, he can invalidate the EX safe operation if he changes the gland. Back to the EX technician or inspector, if he were to use a silicon-based grease, that would foul, destroy the gas sensor. So the EX inspector can invalidate the functional operation of the gas detector. Okay, we'll close the poll now. So when considering this, there is your maintenance team and then there's your EX team. Usually your maintenance team concerns themselves with functional operation, functional safety, while the EX team concerns themselves with the EX safe operation of the device that it is maintained. If these two departments do not intercommunicate, there is chance for faults to happen for the other department on that device. So when we talk about safety integrity levels and EX, they're all risk assessments. When we compare them, it's not one for one exactly the same, but when you consider zone two, somebody made a mistake on there, I'm supposed to say zone two, we're talking about lot likely for a gas cloud to be present. So level one, we're, think, we're saying that the, the probability of dangerous failure is low. When we consider zone one, likely the gas can be present. So two, there's a higher probability of dangerous failure. So we need a higher level of safety for that instrumentation. So they are risk analysis. When we talk about hazardous area zoning classification, we have to take into account ventilation, environmental conditions. 
Those are important during the hazard for figuring out the SIL ratings, for figuring out the safety. Sorry, one sec. For figuring out the required safety integrity levels. And for us to figure out dispersion of the potential hazardous, hazardous gases and vapors, how they shall disperse, and our potential sources of release, whether they be an emission type that is a secondary, a first, or a continuous source of release. So it's they're all based on risk assessments. So what's coming in the future? IEC 60079-44, personal competence. Within this standard, they are providing guidance to clarify, define, and assess the definition of competency across regions and differing standards. So NEC for America, EN for Europe, IEC, Voluntary International, ASNZS, Australia and other ones around the world. Now, within this standard, they are considering, perhaps, procurement personnel, management staff, operations and process technicians, commissioning, feed stage activities, as necessary classification, design, safety integrity levels, versus EX. So this standard, which will probably come into effect in one to two years time, specifically may touch on commissioning and operations and process technicians. So one, that's where this gap, this crossing the gap is happening. Between functional safety and EX, this standard has the potential to bring these two different departments together to realize that the actions of one department can have a negative reaction on the other. So the current approach, we have separate departments and functions. So functional safety, you have design, selection, installation, maintenance, Sorry about the repeat about of inspection. For EX, we have design, selection, inspection, maintenance, repair, overhaul. So these functions are the same, but different, a little bit different industry. Now, when we talk about what does not comply, with EX, if we're talking about hazardous area classification, so just before the design stage, what does not comply with the hack or the design of EX cannot be part of a HAZOP, part of the SIL, the SIF. So if the HAZOP team is not part of the hack, the considerations of EX the considerations of incorrect selection of equipment, not considering um, environmental factors can be missed. So the hack can't be considered during a hazard. We're defining the layers of protection, but the teams can intercommunicate if you include the hazard has a team as part of the hack creation, these can be addressed. So does one activity have potential to invalidate the other? Certainly. If an EX technician, like we said, for a gas detector, if he uses a silicon grease, he can invalidate the functional safety 
of that device. It is meant to detect gas and to report that. If it fails, perhaps it isn't in the software system. Maybe it doesn't show as a fault. So there's chances for one department to invalidate the other department's installations, procedures. So we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, we want to thank EAC Systems. Uh, they are global industrial and integration and commissioning specialists. They are the experts in um, functional safety. We are the specialists in hazardous areas and EX. So if anybody has any questions, please ask and we will attempt to answer all of them. If any of them we can't answer at this time, we will uh, respond by email. Let's go back to leave it open for another two minutes to see if anybody has any questions. It is a very difficult subject between those who work in functional safety and those who work in EX. Rarely is it talked about uh, between those departments. When we talk about quality departments, quality departments are usually a function after construction and finishes at mechanical completion. Now, after mechanical completion, the commissioning technicians can make physical changes to the EX installation, which invalidates the EX installation. And then after they make changes and part of the CSU commissioning and startup, the EX technicians can also make changes that invalidate their work. Uh, we have a question that is, is there any part of 61508 that is like 60079? 61508 is more to do with the um, software programming. So there would be, for gas detectors, there is a standard 60079-28 or 29, I believe. So there would be the requirements within there as to the programming. What is the position of this method and the HSE department? Now, the HSE department, if it's purely an HSE personnel, what is their EX competency? We have seen where area classifications is managed by the safety department on a oil and gas facility. And we ask, um, are you using anti-static clothing? And they have a negative response. So they don't understand the 13 different potential ignition source types. They don't have the, perhaps the knowledge of EX to a sufficient level. If you were to have an HSEQ personnel, they have a better chance, but many end users do involve their safety team and they have put them on uh, hazardous area training. Can the EX team be the same as the functional safety team? No, but you can have, well, actually some end users may allow that. It depends on regions and regulations. Now, even within EX, we are trying to separate the technician who does rectifications and the inspector. 
if the inspector does repairs, you are not getting the honest, truthful uh, status of your installation. So you even keep those teams separated. So when it comes to your EX team and your functional safety team, no, you would want to keep them separate, but we don't want siloing. We don't want barriers between each other. There needs to be perhaps competency training on both sides of the fence of each team to understand how they can invalidate each other's work. Software EX considerations. How does it impact an, a, a component placed in a hazardous area if it is always a flame proof equipment with all specifications of it as EXD or EXDE or EXMA? So, software considerations, there could be a software setting which changes the equipment which then it could produce more heat it depends on component by component it could change its operation it could invalidate its operation so if it's an exd piece of equipment if it was specifically rated for only t3 but was within one degree of being t2 if the software to be changed, has it been verified and validated that that function would not do that? It's an emerging industry. It's one that is not well understood. So when 60079-44 comes into effect, then all HAZUP teams should comply to have both functional EX competencies. The, fun the standard is still under discussion, but it's looking like these other departments, such as commissioning, process, and maintenance personnel shall have to have some level of EX competency, whether it be low, medium, or high that will have to be defined by the standard. And then the end user will choose how to comply. With the expected level of competency, if a commissioning technician was expected to have medium to high level of competency, some uh, facilities, some end users, owner operators may say high level of competency will be required while others may disagree and only say some medium level. How can competency be defined? Supervision, uh, a circulum vitae, in-house competency system, ICXCOPC, COMPEX. There's many different ways to prove it. Some are much better than others and have a better track record. But depending where you are in the world, some things are not possible. Different regulations have different impacts. How do you include your handover dossier, the protection types and or sill levels? I'd say that'd be pretty easy. If you had the commissioning department's uh, information as to the sill levels, it should be on the data sheets of the instruments. Add another column, put the sill levels in there. I would suggest that the commissioning CSU departments start becoming involved in the EX handover dossier. We are doing a quality activity, verifying documentation is as per what was ordered. So quality can actually be embedded. The quality department can be embedded in the construction, the commissioning, the EX team, the operations team. So these functions cross over boundaries. When we do siloing, that's when we have these incidents happen, such as BP Texas City.
In short, any component to be used in hazardous area will have its gas and dust protection techniques. Correct. And we in the UX industry have to concern ourselves with the functional safety of it so we don't invalidate it. But those after us, the functional safety people need to consider the EX safe operation. But during design, it's the other way around. The functional safety people have to concern themselves with the hazardous area classification and EX design. So the level of competency will become a mandatory requirement. It, the IEC standards are a voluntary, global voluntary uh, standard. Some countries like Australia apply it nearly wholly, 95 to 90%, 99% similar, sometimes to a greater level, sometimes to a lesser level. Each country also has their own individual regulations. So as to where it becomes mandatory, the end users will be the drivers of these competencies. So the owner operators, they will probably see cost benefit analysis of applying this standard. I certainly can. Having been on projects where money was saved by not by removing the need for EX inspections on fire and gas and SIS ESD equipment that was outside of hazardous areas. A few million dollars was saved, but the project has gone over budget 300%. So the critical safety system devices will not have any EX inspection done on them. They are meant to operate during sources of release, uncontrolled gas clouds. So I myself, when applying hierarchy of control, I would say that uh, they have caused potential future issues for themselves, but they did a risk assessment and they decided that that was their path forward. Any other questions or agree this is a big industry to look over? Yes. When we do siloing, when we do our own functions and don't care about others, that is where, when we show, the presentation was released just recently on BP, Texas City. This Raffinette Tower, the instrumentation was modified. The maintenance done on it was incorrect and it no longer measured the correct level of the liquid in the tower. Somebody made the choice to move the uh, workers' trailers right on site. I believe 15 people died when this uh, facility blew up. Uh, the chemical, the uh, the whether it was gasoline or whatever it was that was blown out of the tower was sprayed everywhere. A vehicle driving right next to it sucked that in, the vapors, and the diesel engine ignited that had a hazardous atmosphere. So functional safety and EX safety was definitely an issue. It was a failure of people and a failure of equipment, usually caused by a human-induced fault, caused by people. If no more questions, we want to thank you for your time. Should you have any further questions in detail or service requests, uh, we at Index and EAC Systems would be happy to oblige. Just give it 30 seconds.
Yes, we will share the presentation via email to everybody via a YouTube video for you to watch afterwards. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a uh, wonderful good morning, afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be.